We're recording today on the lands of the Jagera people and we acknowledge that um, the traditional owners here. Today, Drew Pavlou is going to tell us what he thinks is the way forward for us as we move beyond COVID-19 and rebuild our communities. Thanks for coming to talk, talk to us today, Drew. No, thank you so much, Andrew, for having me. Thank you so much, Tim, as well. Um, no, I'm very, very excited to speak on your podcast. You've been really busy. Um, I'm yes. going to do a quick overview of your story. Yes. So okay. you live in Brisbane. You went to Villanova. Yeah. You're Greek. Okay. Yeah, it's Greek. It's Greek. Um, okay. After high school, you went to University of Queensland to study a Bachelor of Arts majoring in philosophy. Yes. So got that right? Okay. Philosophy, history and English literature. Okay. And in 2019, you organised a protest at the university. Yeah. Okay. Um, during this time, you had a seat on the UQ uh, Union Senate. No. So I all. So at that time, when I organised that first protest, I was I had no position. I was just. Oh, um, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. But this was at the time of the 2019-2020 Hong Kong protests. Okay. Yeah. So if we go back to the day that you had this, you had this protest, yes, right? Yes. You're passionate kid at uni and yeah. then you were suspended for six months. Um, yeah. And this is because this this professor, he he kind of got involved with what this student was doing and got yeah. the, he encouraged these counter um, counter protest yes. against you and you got assaulted, but you got suspended for six yeah. months. Such a crazy story. So I went and there was only 15 people with me and it was a one hour sit in and we were actually like 10 minutes away from leaving. There had been no problems at all. And, you know, mm. it was actually like, an, it was like a protest that was actually organized with like leftists. Like I had actually asked Socialist Alternative on campus to attend and support it because yeah, um, I had actually, like I had always had kind of a, a fractious relationship with UQ Socialist Alternative, but I had actually spoken alongside them at, um, at the protest against the Ramsey Institute at UQ. So like right. I actually had come to it from a sort of left thing and like I had actually asked um, UQ Social Alternative, their leader, Ula, who's this young Muslim woman, I asked her to speak on, because it was an issue also real involving Uyghurs. Um, and so they were speaking, like, it was a small protest. It was actually like trying, we had tried to organize it with like, you know, left groups on campus, although some conservative students did come as well. Um, but yeah, like 10 minutes before it was about to end, um, I guess I was sitting down and I was, um, I was coming, trying to think up a chance because I had no idea like what to do. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. I just was chanting like Xi Jinping's got to go. Hey, hey, ho, ho. Xi Jinping's got to go. <laughs> and then, um, and then a Chinese nationalist, and it, this guy was in his thirties, and he was a big hulking guy, and he had a backpack, and he was in a big jack jacket and black sunglasses. He yeah. Came in from the side, and he reached down, grabbed my megaphone. I was trying to hold on to it. He like snatched it out of my hands, smashed it on the ground. And my initial response was like, I knew everyone. I'd never been in a fight before in my entire life. Like never right. thrown a punch in anger I, if anything like in school i probably like got picked on a little bit sometimes like i got punched in the arm a lot and like <laughs> never really like fight back but i just knew like they tried to take your salami or something yeah like, <laughs> I, I knew i was kind of like i just knew i'd been i looked up and like i'd been and i realized that we'd been surrounded and oh shit, there were actually a lot of chinese nationalists about that surrounded us on all sides and i knew people were filming and stuff and i was like oh even though I've never thrown a punch before in anger, even though I've never fought in my life, like I've got to like, you know, just stand up for myself. Like I can't be seen to just like, you know, have yeah. this guy snatch the megaphone from me, smash it on the ground and do nothing. So I, I got up, I tried to push him back because like it was self-defense, you know, this guy had actually like just out of nowhere, basically assaulted me. He'd grabbed my property, smashed it on the ground. I, right. I got up and I tried to push him back. And then a guy from the side had actually come. And if you look at the footage, um, they'd actually like been coordinating, like he had looked over to the side with his mate and this was another guy in a big jacket, sunglasses. He was in his thirties and he actually had an earpiece in and, um, and he had come from a different direction. If you look at the footage, they looked over to each other before they attacked me. So when I went up to push him, this guy had come in from the side, punched me in the ribs and thrown me to the ground. And, Jeez. and again, I just, I guess it was just adrenaline. And I wasn't really thinking, I was like, I just have to stand up for myself. I got back up. I tried to push again. And then that's when they got me in the mouth and I like, I yeah, got punched in the jaw and I was thrown to the ground and then Uni is rough. And then I got up and then at that point I realized, yeah, we'd been surrounded completely. Uh, I think the police estimate at that point in time of the day was there were yeah. 300 Chinese nationalists. 
So yeah. our protests of 15 people have been surrounded by 300 not Chinese nationals on all sides. Um, the, yeah. leader, the leader, the, if you look at the footage, the second I got punched, the Chinese national anthem got started playing. So it actually was something that oh, wow. invaded. The leader, yeah. the leader held up a huge boom box and he was playing the Chinese national anthem and they were trying to drown us out. And, yeah. and a lot of them were holding up signs saying like Hong Kong is China and and um, like Hong Kong is the dogs and like just insulting yeah. stuff. And they were screaming out abuse and hurling abuse. Um, and then I was like, oh, my God, what do we do? And I got up and I tried to um, organize our resistance, I suppose, which was 10, 15 people, but we were surrounded on all sides. And at that point, a guy in a, Chi in a, guy, a Chinese nationalist guy in a uh, skeleton teeth mask, he came up behind me punched me in the back of the head while my back was turned. It was a coward punch. Yeah. And those are so yeah. dangerous. People can die from those. If I was, yeah, on, yeah. I was on concrete, if he had knocked me out and my head, head hit the concrete, you know, people yeah. go to hospital for that. He, yeah. he coward punched me from behind. And then when I fell to the ground, he grabbed my, um, my poster and um, ripped it up. And then we was, yeah. we were just trying to work out what to do. And I was trying to yell to my friends, you know, yell out the chant when, what do we do when fascists um, attack, stand up, fight back. And we we're trying to chant, but we were getting, you know, uh, droned out by their huge boom speaker. And then yeah. at that point, um, the security guards tried to step in and uh, UQ's investigation, they had a photo of this. Um, the same guy bit the security guard's hand and there's a huge bite mark on the security guard's hand in a photo that the UQ, uh, that UQ had in the investigation. Yeah. And you got a seat on the UQ Senate at some yes. stage, but then you yes. lost it. Yeah. So, because um, of all of this. So basically um, at that point, I was still in Young Labour, but I wouldn't. I hadn't been involved really at all in anything with regard yeah. to the Labour Party. It was just a member on paper, and yeah. and in the aftermath of those protests and when I was attacked and everything, and I had the death threats, I was like, I'm going to run for the UQ Senate, and so I yeah. ran for the UQ Senate. And then the the Young Labour had a big candidate um, who was the UQ Union president at the time, and they yeah. were all so so angry when I nominated against her. Um, because they were like, oh, you're betraying the party, blah, blah. And I was like, well, I've never even really gone to an event or anything. Like, I'm just myself. And yeah. so they all went so, so feral at me and they were attacking me. And um, and another Labor candidate, she wrote, she ran a pro-China campaign on WeChat, which was like which was like attacking me and saying, like, if you want to stop the Hong Kong troublemaker, Drew Pavlou, vote for uh, Gabby Starr um, to stop him for the UQ Senate. So this UQ Senate campaign became really vicious and I was receiving death threats again. I actually somehow won because I was just campaigning so hard. When I get something in my head, I'm so, so determined. So yeah. I had no party behind me, had no money behind me. It was just me and two two friends. And we were just yeah. sending out links. It was an online election, so we just sent out links to every single person we knew at UQ. And I was campaigning yeah. six, seven hours a day for nothing. Just I was so, so... I was so determined and I said, when I get in, I'm going to donate the $25,000 a year salary to the Uyghurs. And I actually did do that when I got wow. in. Yeah, when I got in, I donated, yeah. um, I think I donated $17,000 before they kicked me off the Senate. So I got $17,000 uh, for my time on the Senate. It was supposed to be 100000 No, it was supposed to be $50,000 over two years. I got to $17,000 mm. um, before they kicked me off. And I donated, yeah. I donated every single cent to Uyghurs. Yeah, but then when you lost that seat, another guy, and this was a really interesting story, yeah. another guy changed his name to <laughs> Drew Pavlou. Yeah. What happened to that guy? Has he changed his name back again? No, he's still Drew Pavlou legally. See, the, there's so much here. It, it, I want to write a book. I actually have been... Yeah, you've got a manifesto coming, haven't yes, you? Uh, that... I've, I've actually been writing a book and I'm trying to find a publisher because, look, I think it's a crazy story. Like, there's just so much because, I mean... I started off like just, you know, son of a fruit shop manager. And then sudden, and then suddenly I was like enemy number one in Australia for the Chinese government. And, and basically the reason I got expelled was because the Chinese government then begun after I got elected to the Senate, which was a position they couldn't um, ignore me on. Then the Chinese government started putting out newspaper articles um, in the Chinese national press saying that I was racist and that I should be expelled. And so the university yeah. then brought in three law firms. Um, they ended up admitting to parliament. They spent yeah. half a million dollars trying to expel me. And um, and then they eventually, they were seeking permanent expulsion so that even, so it'd be lifetime expulsion. So I had six months left on my courses, but, yeah. but the way it would have worked, if they were successful, they wanted to make it so that even at 70 years old, I wouldn't even be able to go to UQ or whatever. And, um, yeah. and obviously as part of that, I would lose my Senate seat, which I was democratically elected to. Um, they, and are you still suing the U UQ for three point yeah. five million? Yeah. So I was very, very <laughs> lucky that um, one of Australia's best barristers, Tony Morris QC, he represented. He offered to represent me for free. So I was so lucky. I was so lucky. And um, 
UQ brought in Mint Ellison and they had a partner at Mint Ellison, one of the most expensive law firms in Australia, um, right. come in and the process was so, so rigged and unfair. Like they had a kangaroo court where it was like UQ employees and then they yeah. brought in they brought in the partner at Mint Allison to represent the university's position and they were telling their own employees the university's position is that we want you to expel Drew Pablo for life. And, yeah. um, and the process was so unfair. Originally, they didn't even want to let me have a lawyer. They were saying you're only allowed one support person and the whole thing has to be confidential. They were trying to say that I can't even speak about it. And, yeah. I, remember, and I was like, no, I'm going to be speaking about it and my support person is going to be Tony Morris QC. And they were really yeah. upset. And, um, but, but we, we actually, thanks to Tony's work, and we built so much public pressure, um, we got it down to two years initially, and then there was still so much public pressure. And I think the actual, I think this is actually, this was reported in the press, the education minister at the time, Dan Tian, actually rung up the chancellor, Peter Varghese, and said, this is unacceptable, the government doesn't accept this, you'll have to yeah. this. And then Peter Varghese. Yeah, I think that Professor Guy should have lost his job, really. Yeah, he should have. And he still, he got a five-year, that's the problem. He got a five-year new contract, and then yeah. the Hoy, he already was planning to leave UQ in August, but he went to the University of Adelaide, got a new million dollar salary. So no one was ever. Yeah. Planned. It was like they yeah. were actually rewarded. And didn't you actually um, have a petition to stop free trade in China or something? Well, yeah, How many I've, people signed that peti I, I've petition? I've done lots of petitions. Um, I think the biggest petition we ever had was the petition against my expulsion. We actually had 50,000 signatures, basically. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and I'll try to explain. But if we were going to have like no war with China, like it, you Sorry, know, what you is, if we were going to have, say, no war with China, you know, I know that you are um, pretty vocal about um, our our tensions, you know, or, yeah. the, or the tension between China and Taiwan, yeah. like, um, you know, uh, how many people did you get to sign that petition oh, look, of, um, of stopping think, uh, free trade with China? Look, um, basically, we have a free trade agreement with China. It was signed by Tony Abbott in like 2014. I think yeah. it's completely unfair because um, in China, trade unions are banned. So any worker who tries to organize um, their workspace to have a trade union, they get killed basically. Like there have been yeah. disappearances. So my position is until the Chinese people are allowed to have independent trade unions and, and also until these atrocities stop, we shouldn't have a free trade agreement with China. And they've basically breached it anyway by launching economic sanctions against us. So I was saying just rip it up. It's already effectively ripped up. We, we right. had thousands of people sign up to that petition. And it is a, oh, did you? Yeah, okay. and it is, a, it is a position we have for our independent Senate campaign. However, yeah. I, because you're running this now at 22, you're running this um, yeah. Drew Pavlu Democratic Democratic Alliance. Yes, right? yes. Drew 22 for the under underdog. You've taken all of these experiences and yeah. you've put it into you like it forms the basis of your policies, which yeah. you yeah. you feel are like your policies for your Senate, um, uh, you know, your Senate um, campaign are based on. Um, human rights and putting putting yeah. human rights at the centre of federal policy. Yes, right. Yes. And I've just had a look at your website, and yeah. um, your your policies are sort of loosely based um, on standing up to China and protection of human rights. Yeah. Um, and obviously, China is like um, you know it's a big subject at the moment for a lot of Aussies. Yeah. Um, strengthening Aussie democracy to fight corruption. Yes. Um, and that, renewable super. Yeah. Again, that, again, that's something that came out of my own experiences because I saw just how dirty politics was up close. I saw how like major, like people with a lot of power in in Australia, like these university executives, they had millions of dollars right. that to go after me. They brought in even PR firms to smear me. Um, right. So it's busting open that sort yeah, of and power. I, you know, I was attacked by the Australian Financial Review really viciously. I was attacked really viciously in the Adelaide media when Peter Hoy returned, like, like there was some really vicious stuff, like, and I saw yeah. those, and I was trying to like, I was trying to ask MPs to support me. And really like, there were a, like, sadly, the only Greens, who, the only Green who helped me um, was John O'Shree. And I really liked Jono, but even Jono, like every time he helped me, he had to preface it by going, oh, look, I don't always agree with what Drew says and stuff like that. So it just felt like a lot of people on the left, like just didn't want to touch yeah. me. And I, I wrote to Penny Wong and I was like, look, Penny, you know, I'm actually, I was in labor. I want to, I'm coming from to this from a human rights perspective. I know you've actually supported Hong Kong democracy and stuff. I'm really hoping that labor can help me here. I don't want it to just be a liberal thing. Cause at that time, the only people who were supporting me were Sky News and News Corp. And I was, I actually wrote to yeah. her office. I was saying, I really want some support from people in labor. And she actually ignored it. And then two months later, her chief of staff wrote back 
And this was after I'd already yeah. felt, and it was like, oh, sorry, we don't get involved in internal disciplinary things at universities. Right, and, I see. And so the only people who really supported me, they were like two or three liberal people, like like James Patterson, um, who's now the Intelligence Committee Chair, and then Bob Catter. And then that's how I became friends with Bob Catter, because like, I actually, then I was read, then I was talking with Bob, and people think of him as very, very right wing, and he isn't. He is on. Look, he's very conservative on social matters. However, like we were talking, and he was like. Drew, you know, in America, I'd probably vote for Bernie Sanders. The only thing I disagreed with him on was abortion. And I was like, oh, my God. Like, because at the end of the day, he's actually like, and he actually was going like, basically my policies, like he's basically an agrarian socialist. He's like, he's kind of got quite left-wing policies. Like he's actually stood up in parliament and called for a royal commission into the free market and stuff like that. And he's constantly yeah. attacking free, free market rubbish and stuff like that. So we actually kind of uh, talked a lot about that and how our views overlapped. And then yeah. I was thinking, like, my, my thinking at the time was, because he was the only MP who had backed me, and I loved, like, the kind of funny stuff that, I love this funny crocodile stuff. I love this funny, like, person. Yeah. Like that. Obviously, I did, then, obviously I did all, agree on the, um, on the conservative, like, stuff that was, right. like, because he had You've also got renewable superpower, economic nation building. Now, yeah. if, we're, if we're talking about, you know, China and all that stuff within that, um, you know, are you looking at, um, you know, net zero emissions by yeah, 2030, yeah. that sort of yeah. stuff? Look, look, this is the thing, right? Like, I think all these issues intersect because they're actually, I actually see this ultimately as even like the Chinese government and its atrocities. I actually see it almost as a crisis of global capitalism as well, because a lot of sometimes the mistake a lot of people on the left make. Not not mainstream people. We call them more tankies. These are the people who support like authoritarian communist regimes and stuff. They think they seem to think that the Chinese government is communist just simply because it has communists in the name. But in fact, like China is now one of the key drivers of the global capitalist economy. And it, it has such deplorable, in, incredible rates of poverty and inequality. It's even more unequal than America. So side by side with, you know, having the most billionaires in the entire world, side by side with having people worth $100 billion in the, in the Chinese countryside, there is there's a really good book called Invisible China, and it reveals that up to one third of, of children in the Chinese countryside, and keep in mind that the majority of kids are still born in the Chinese countryside, um, up to one third will face permanent developmental stunting due to, um, due to intestinal worms, malnutrition, things that could really easily be rectified. This is, one of the, this is now one of the most wealthy governments on earth. Um, the Chinese ruling class is extraordinarily wealthy, and yet that is, that is existing side by side with malnutrition. So the way I often see this is, I think what happened was there was almost this sort of symbiosis between the Western capital elite and the Chinese capital elite. Um, it was almost like this pact written in blood because after Tiananmen Square, people knew how brutal the Chinese government was. And yet Western governments and Western business leaders still decided to really, really heavily invest in China. And I think it's because the, the pact that was written was almost like this. To bypass trade unions in the West, to bypass um, an organised working class in the West that was demanding higher wages, etc., um, they had to basically offshore production. And how would they do that? They could go to China, where trade unions are banned, where the Chinese government, in, in many ways, the in many ways, the pact that Deng Xiaoping wrote with the Chinese people in the aftermath of Tiananmen, what Tiananmen represented, people often don't realise this, but it was also a really heavily Many of the hundreds of people, so we don't know how many people were murdered in Tiananmen. A lot of people seem, a lot of people um, think that the main massacres occurred in Tiananmen Square itself. Mm. In, in reality, it seems that most of the massacres that occurred with Tiananmen Square actually were in the suburbs of Beijing and it yeah. was in working class neighborhoods where trade unions were, were, were like fighting really strongly against the government and they're demanding better protections for the workplaces, etc. And that, that was actually the main site of the military crackdown where thousands of people were killed. And so part of Tiananmen Square and the Tiananmen crackdown was like Deng Xiaoping saying there will be limited economic freedom in the sense that we will allow like capitalism to exist in China. We will kind of allow free markets to exist in China, but there will be no political freedoms. There will be no trade unions, etc. And the Western elite saw that. And I think they didn't care. They actually thought that was good because they could bypass strong Western they could spike past strong working class trade union organization in the West by just simply offshoring to China where the, where the, the social, 
uh, where the, the social contract written in the aftermath of the brutal Tiananmen massacre was, we're going to not allow any trade unions, we're not going to allow any civil society mm. to form at all. We're going to, and so what happened was um, the Chinese leadership and the Chinese elite, they benefited massively because the West basically poured trillions in capital investment in, and those trillions that were poured in, um, I mean, they were distributed very unequally in China. Obviously, there has been a huge growth in China, and a lot of people have been lifted out of poverty. But a lot of a lot of the time, the Chinese government goes, you know, we lifted 800 million people out of poverty. Well, if you look at the statistics, a lot of the time, that is like really poverty in name only, because it's like if you're just defining it as two dollars a day, and then you're lifting people to four dollars a day in a country where there are billionaires, like it's yeah. Still... So. So, well, I'm glad that you've got another section on there saying no Aussie left behind tackle poverty and exactly. homelessness Sorry. because like a lot of what you talk about though has it seemingly has to do with China and see, you know see, I have see. to say that a lot of people are going to be saying you know can we can we not think globally but like act locally you know can yeah, you... Well, that's actually how I'm trying to that's how I'm trying to think though because like the so there, there was that pact I think between the Western elites and the Chinese elites and it didn't really help the Chinese people because the massive investment that went in, it went into like the, the well-connected party leaders. It went in and a lot was taken in the form of corruption. A lot of it was taken in the form of kickbacks. And the people who really, really benefited were the people who were connected with the Chinese Communist Party. So, yeah. so it benefited the Chinese elite and it also benefited the Western elite because then, then all of a sudden the Western elite could basically just offshore manufacturing. And so a lot of the traditional industries that the working class relied upon died. And one of the main ways that people were able to earn a stable income without a university education was basically ripped away from them. And yeah. as a result, we've had this kind of shift towards over time, over decades, it's now a shift towards like the gig economy where people are on short term contracts, where people have no power, we're all atomized. Uh, the working class union, the working class trade unions, they've actually been broken. So basically this shift to China it coincided with the breaking of the trade union movement in Australia, in the West as well. That saw huge spikes in inequality. So part yeah. of what we want to do is we actually want, like, firstly, um, on just... So if you, if you were going to work, if you were going to say three big things yeah. that our local community needs to rebuild yeah. now that we've had coronavirus, yeah. what, what are three big things that you reckon we need? So, so we can, we need sovereign supply chains. So what coronavirus, what the coronavirus has shown us and also what the Chinese government's trade war has shown us is this system where we're just offshoring everything and a lot of it is offshored onto to a country where the dictatorship is very brutal like that does not work um so we want sovereign supply chains we want to bring back australian manufacturing the really good thing is that can coincide with the green revolution so there are now trillions of dollars going into renewable energy australia is so well positioned for the, for meeting this revolution because we've got all the rare earth mil minerals that you need to make things like batteries to make solar panels to make uh, mm -hmm. electric vehicles so things like cobalt things like lithium we've got that right here in australia we've okay so my thinking is it, it's all linked together right like we can lift up people in the regions who've been left behind because they were some of the biggest uh losers in this huge like kind of like shift to the global ec global capitalist economy they were like, left behind we can rebuild working class communities we yeah. don't have to base like a lot of the time people try and present um sadly people try and present the um, shift or the transition to renewables as something that will inevitably have losers. I don't think that has to be the case. And in fact, it should not be the case. So the just transition is so important to us. We're saying everyone who's currently, you know, a coal miner, everyone who's working in those fossil fuel industries, let's give them guaranteed jobs in mining lithium, copper, cobalt, the things that you need to make electric vehicles, the things that you need to make batteries. And then we manufacture batteries, we manufacture electric vehicles right here. We bring back advanced Australian manufacturing. And okay. so this, this would solve all these issues, you know, because we're, yeah. we're, we're protecting Australia's independence so that we're no longer at risk of the Chinese government's economic coercion. We're b rebuilding the Australian working class because yeah. we're, bringing back, um, we're bringing back manufacturing jobs, we're bringing back long-term good paying jobs that, right. long-term good paying jobs that don't need to be gigified, that don't, like, if the choice, because the problem is sometimes that in a lot of these regional towns, if the choice is between, you know, the coal mine, which is the only employer, and just poverty. Like mm. People are obviously going to be so resistant to the transition. We're like, we're saying, no, these towns, we should actually be building massive solar arrays out there. We should be building stuff out there. Let's give them jobs. Let's make sure no okay. one's behind. Guaranteed jobs. I want a job guarantee. 
Um, right. So it's like it's like you rebuild Australian working class, the Australian working class. You address inequality. You address the climate crisis by shifting climate crisis. Renewables. Okay. Yep. Um, yep. You have big economic growth Excellent. by shifting to renewables, and then also we're dealing with the Chinese government's coercion, and then also we're making a humanitarian stance on their atrocities by saying we're not going to be offshoring trade to China anymore because. There are these terrible atrocities, and also the Chinese working class have not benefited from this because, in fact, most of the profits have been stolen by the Chinese government. It's elite, and we want. Okay. To, and I, I want to put pr economic pressure on that elite. Excellent. And there's a hammock for every man, woman, and child. I hear. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Because, <laughs> um, as well as my policies, um. Obviously, there's a bit of I want to include a bit of humour and satire and stuff like that, and just take yeah. it out of kind of establishment politics as well. Because the thing is, um, you know, people are sick of just the kind of ordinary way politics is operate. Because I think what happens is politicians deliberately want to make it boring because they don't want the public to be engaged. Yes. So, so like, and and that's been one of the biggest shifts over the past few decades. That shift towards technocracy and trying to take so many um, things that used to be under the democratic control of the people, and so many so many issues that used to be um, you know a subject of democratic debate, they've been yeah. shifted, taken away, and they've just been sort of like siloed off as these sort of. So, for example, um, you know, the Reserve Bank of Australia. I mean, we used to have economic, we used to have political economic. Like interest rates and all that sort of stuff, that is an inherently a political issue, and yet that is something that they've tried to silo off as depoliticized, as this kind of independent thing. So there's this, been this shift to technocracy, and democracy has actually been undermined with that shift. And we want absolutely to we want to give democracy back to people. And absolutely, I mean, the people think politics is boring. People think yeah, they, they all talk in that's the, why we're doing this. They, yeah. People talk in the language of the managerial elite, that technocratic elite, because they want yeah. to politicise everything. They want to take the politics out of it. When in fact, yes. these, are, these are questions about, you know, how we will all live together as a society. That is fundamentally yeah. political. So people are yeah. bored with politics. People hate the way it's currently conducted because it's deliberately made boring. It's de deliberately depoliticised because that, the elite doesn't want people to be engaged. And yeah. we want to engage people and we'll be entertaining. We'll be fun. We'll be humorous. We do. We'll, That's we'll... why we're doing this as well, Drew. Yeah. Yeah. Drew, we've run out of time. And... Oh, no, I'm sorry. It's been so long. I just get I just get so worked up, you know. Yeah, but it's been so good having you on and having a chat to you today. So thank, thank you, so, you so much for coming no, in and talking so much. to us. I, I'm sorry. I, I hope I didn't just talk about China too much. Like, I tried to... <laughs> Because <laughs> what, what I want to show is like these issues, I think, are really connected. Inequality, the climate crisis, the Chinese government's brutal atrocities. Um, yeah. And, the... and making politics work for people and, and yeah. you know, really breaking it down um, so that people do engage. This is, yes. yeah, this is what we need. Yeah. Um, oh, thank you so much. Obviously, I know it's a very, very difficult, like, like it's a, such a big ask, I guess, to run at 22 and we don't have a party machine behind us. We don't have any money. We, you know, it's, it's really just... It's a grassroots thing. And I know, yeah. it's, I know it's a big ask to get elected and stuff yeah. like that. But so, look, look, firstly, at least we want to get the message out. We want to show that politics can be done differently. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, if somehow lightning strikes, you know, I do believe, you know, that things work out. You visualise it. You just work so hard. Sometimes things just work out. You know, if that happens, it may. I want to get in and then I'll be an independent voice. I'll, I'll basically go up against... The ma both major parties, I'll try fight for, yeah, renewables, anti-corruption, giving democracy back to communities again, fighting inequality, fighting the Chinese Co Communist Party and its brutal atrocities. Like, it, it's it's a it's a program yeah. that is it's a program that's dedicated to giving power back to people who've been left behind. Okay, well, it's as I said, it's been great talking to you.